Welcome everybody to the December 14th meeting of the Historic Resources Board. Uh, would staff please call a roll. Chair Bernstein. Here. Vice Chair Bauer. Here. Board Member Corey. Here. Board Member Benenberg. Board Member Kohler. Here. Board Member Mackinnon. Here. Board Member Wimmer. Five present. Thank you. And um, first, I'd like to uh, thank all and welcome all the board members who've been reelected to the uh, Historic Resources Board. Congratulations. Oh, good, great. Uh, first on our meeting is oral communications. Uh, the members of the public may speak to any item not on the agenda. I don't have any cards from the members of the public, nor do I see any members of the public here. We'll move on to if there are any uh, agenda changes, additions, and deletions. None. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, city official reports, uh, board meeting schedule and assignments. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Bauer. Um, I know that this is our last meeting of the year and um, as uh, a member of the board, I wanted to thank staff for all of their hard work for all of the weeks that you come and see us. And I hope that we'll see you much more often next year because we'll have that much more work that we want to review. So thank you very much for your um, dedication and thoroughness. Great, nice sentiment, and I agree with those comments too. Thank, and th you. thank you for the fine breakfast. <laughs> yes, very right. nice. <laughs> Good. I'll be here next Wednesday as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next on our agenda is a study session for um, discussion of potential retreat topics for 2018. Shall staff have any comments to start us off? Yes, um, so uh, we have a PowerPoint to um, display the potential retreat topics here. Um, and we, when we say January 11th, that is a target date. Uh, we have not advertised it yet, but um, obviously advertising will happen soon uh, because of the holidays. So uh, we kind of wanted to find out if, if there was cap uh, capacity. Uh, in other words, are people available on the 11th for a retreat? We start with that. Um, that would be the first meeting of January. We do have a uh, second meeting of January, which would be potential follow-up on these ICLER uh, guidelines that you are discussing today. And with that, I'll let Emily present the PowerPoint. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate uh, what Amy was saying about the potential date of January 11th. That would be, is that better? Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, the one of the reasons we picked that date is so we could discuss the CLG annual report, which is due on January 22nd. If we do it earlier, that way um, everyone could provide input on that, uh, that document. And you'll notice that there was a sheet at each of your places. Um, I've, I've received the statements from some of you, but uh, it would be nice to get that sometime before uh, the 22nd. <laughs> uh, so here's, again, here's just some of the uh, potential retreat topics. Uh, that picture you saw earlier was from the interior of the ITT building. Uh, did we want to? Okay, so I'm just going to run through these real quick. Uh, so one that would be a good idea would be the Mills Act uh, and discussing the continuing work that the subcommittee is doing the Girl Scout House over at Rinconada Park and its potential uh, National Register listing and California landmarking, uh, the ITT building and uh, what should be happening with that building, uh, continuing discussion of demolition issues, uh, the comp plan update, Eichler guideline implementation, uh, Native American month, which is uh, November, uh, Historic Preservation Month, which is May, the CPF conference, as well as additional training opportunities uh, I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention, there's a really good sta uh, standards of the in uh, Secretary of the Interior Standards webinar in March, uh, as well as uh, continuing to, disc to discuss the mid-century era context statement grant application, which we had mentioned uh, at a previous meeting. So here are just some of the potential topics. Uh, we obviously can't cover them all, so it would be a good idea to, to pick a few for the retreat. And I would just add to that, we have a, a, just a couple of updates today, um, one on the ITT um, and one on the comp plan update. Um, but we'll talk about that later. 
Okay, thank you. Um, any, uh, this is a study session. Any comments, suggestions from board members? I have one. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. I was going to say, how do you suggest we, we just pick a handful of these or? Um, well, maybe we'll just gauge uh, what you guys are more interested in, less interested in, and we can kind of uh, prepare a, a, a list from there. <laughs> Well, I guess we're looking for feedback at this point. And of course, you can always pick something that's not on this list if there's something that the board would like to discuss as well. And I should say there's always an opportunity at a retreat to discuss how we do things as a board. You know, that's always, you know, what's going well, what's, what could be improved, that type of topic. But we don't have to call that out in particular. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Bauer. So in looking at this list, it would be several um, retreats to cover this amount of information. I uh, would uh, suggest the board think about um, concentrating on things that we're not going to review and uh, make recommendations to the city council next year. So I, in, I think the, the Mills Act discussion, which is going to come before this board, I think early next year, is one we um, wouldn't necessarily need to cover in the retreat. I think the um, Eichler guidelines implementation is, you know, maybe not something we need to think about in the retreat because we're going to hear about it and we're going to have, a, um, up, I think, more opportunities to consider that. Uh, and I'm not sure about the comp plan update. I think that's something we ought to we ought to probably address during a board meeting, rather than at the retreat. Uh, and then the one thing that I'd like to consider is um, a discussion of how this board can um, encourage the city council to list properties or historic districts on the city register so that we can get some. Uh, protection for those properties and some different treatment. So that's related to the comp plan update. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, that's my suggestion. Okay. Um, during the uh, this year's Joint Historic Resources Board City Council meeting, um, it was expressed interest to uh, have uh, some training session for City Council members. Um, so that could be tied in with the CPF conference training opportunities date. Um, uh, so uh, I've heard from uh, council some council members that uh, you know, they believe that the members of the HRB are, have good expertise on the Secretary of Interior standards, and they may then they have not received that training. So that's why they suggested this could be a good application. So if, however that gets arranged between HRB and city council members uh, to uh, have a kind of a detailed discussion about s the standards. That'd be my suggestion for uh, under, and that could ha that happen concurrently during the CPF conference, that could be a good time. Okay, other board members, ideas? Okay. All right. I think that's where our comments are right now. Um, before we move on, any other, before we move on to another agenda item? Board members, Kohler, or you have a comment or something? Okay. Okay. Good. okay. I, I agree with the, the, the other suggestions, so I'm just okay, what it's worth. All right. Oh, we have a nice good list in here. So, um, and, and we, so any other questions or requests from staff on this agenda? Well, I guess we heard from one member that um, of the ones that don't seem to be retreat, uh, you know, uh, uh, not worthy, but you know, the word I'm looking for, just, uh, you know, we can handle them in a different, right. at a different meeting. Um, so what, what we're left with, I guess, if that's a concurrence, and then um, we've got the other ones left um, to discuss. I, I might say, um, the mid-century area has been talked about quite a bit, um, and right now we're in the Eichler uh, moment, mm -hmm. which is about mid-century as well as at least housing. And um, so I, there might be things we want to just float at that meeting regarding that, but um, not to take on the, the grant application because um, we're full into what we got going on now in the Mills Act. Um, so 
That would be the only comment I would have is maybe that's that gets put off. Just in case, I'm just going to throw out my, my opinions for this anyway. So I think the, the Mills Act and the demolition issues and the historic preservation months would be the three topics that I would like to discuss if we had to pick three. But um, I was thinking about the same thing that Board Member Corey just mentioned um, about uh, demolition issues. Um, yeah, um, uh, oh, something I think that we've discussed previous retreats from, as a board was the idea of that uh, uh, if demolition happens, uh, when does a district start losing its district character? Um, uh, so that could be part of the demolition. And there's also this deconstruction, deconstruction. business that's going on to work around. But. Okay. <laughs> Right. And we have an update today on that okay. as well. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Good. Welcome, mem welcome, uh, Council Member Holman, to our meeting. Great, thank you. Good. Okay, um, uh, uh, Council Member Holman, we were just uh, discussing uh, potential topic retreats um, for HRB retreat, and uh, what we've uh, focused on so far is uh, the idea of um, uh, demolition and deconstruction issues. Um, uh, training for HRB and city council, training for council members who uh, would like to have more information about the Secretary of Interior standards and uh, just some of the technical aspects that the HRB is already familiar with. So that could happen concurrently during the CPF conference uh, issue. Okay. And um, is there anything else, uh, board member? Uh, um, Vice Chair? I would recommend that the chair meet with staff and kind of based on this discussion to make a decision so that you you will be able to prepare for the retreat. Okay. Right. It could be chair and vice chair if you wanted to okay. join in. We could, uh, yeah, but we'd that. have to pull yeah. it together next week, basically. Okay. So, okay. As far as a meeting. Okay. All right. Anything else on this agenda item? Good. Uh, yeah, uh, council member Holman. As a council member who's been on planning commission and watched things over the years, um, I think that the uh, training on the secretary standards is really a great idea, but it isn't just for the council, it's for the ARB, it's for, this, for the planning commission, oh, yeah, it's for sure. the building department, because um, all, all of those departments affect and impact the sure. sort of resources. Okay, um, that's a fantastic idea. Um, let's see, so maybe we could add that to the minutes too. Great, good, okay, so that joint, uh, however that training session works, uh, yeah, bringing all boards and commissions involved. That's an excellent idea, for, for sure. Okay, anything else on this agenda item before we move on? Okay, thank you. Uh, next would be a um, action item, and that is public hearing. That's HRB discussion and comments on Eichler design guidelines. Shall staff have an introductory uh, report for us, please? So, um, as noted in the report, we did uh, publish these back on November 9th and provided them to the board. Uh, we ask that you bring your copy today um, and, uh, with the assumption that you'd looked at it and had some uh, comments, uh, if, you know, great, or uh, please do this or that uh, edits for us so we could take a look. If you wanted to go through those as a board, today and provide uh, you know a recommendation we welcome that um with an with the understanding that we are, our next steps are to go to a public uh, workshop we're holding and you're invited in um january january 18th at mitchell park community center where we will uh, have a full discussion of the guidelines with the public who um, can come it's in the evening and uh, we will also discuss uh, potential code changes that uh, could be um, uh, directed by council. And um, so we have kind of a matrix of potential options um, that, the co that the council may direct us to uh, come back with um, and go through the process on that. Um, I think we, we have a couple slides here, uh, perhaps. Um, this shows the uh, kind of flow chart that I prepared to keep my head straight on this. Um, basically, we've got, um, you know, t today, again, comments, or if you choose, recommendation. Um, and then we have the end of the guidelines uh, comment period, January 12th, which happens before the public workshop. Of course, comments are solicited then. 
Um, but we wanted to get written comments, which haven't gotten any so far. Um, and then uh, this, this uh, workshop, as I mentioned, then we can come back to the HRB and talk about the, on the 25th, and talk about the, the code change matrix. We're looking to go to council probably in March, early March, um, to ask the council to adopt the guidelines. Uh, we're gonna, uh, you know, not go to planning commission before council, just on the guidelines. Um, but we will go uh, to the council following, uh, if council directs us to make code changes. Um, and then we will start kind of a process on that. And that looks like, you know, towards June where the council could potentially adopt uh, code changes that related to Eichler's. And that when I say code changes, I mean, you know, option for neighborhoods to elect to have uh, Eichler overlay zone or um, conservation district or any of those. And, you know, potential um, zoning code development standard modifications um, that could be discussed with this board, planning commission, and uh, council. Question, yeah, I was looking through our um, staff report and our, our, our board report. Um, this little chart looks like a great chart for uh, the path of action. I don't, uh, is there some way we can get a copy of that? I don't see it in the, uh, in our packet here. Um, it just, it helps, uh, I know it helped me uh, organize my thoughts about process. We'll email it to the board. Okay, excellent, thank you so much. Okay, with that, um, I know I have uh, several comments to make on these guidelines, but I'll start by asking if any other board members have comments. So. Uh, uh, board member Kohler. Yeah, I think this is a um, good thing to have going here, this cycler setup, because um, I had a very unhappy situation with a client. And yeah, so uh, excuse me for a second. What I'd like to have this focus on is uh, not individual projects that uh, come before well, the point, board the point I'm making, yeah, Martin, yeah, yeah. is that from what I can tell on the booklet, it has, it has opened up the possibility of some situations that previously were not even considered allowed in the Icor neighborhood. What I'm talking about is two-story homes. Okay, okay. And um, there are neighborhoods that have limits on the second floor, is that correct? Correct, yes. But there's a whole lots of areas that don't have. So I, I just read here, it says that, you know, this does not limit the use of two-story homes. So I'm just That is the situation today. I'll, I'll just give a brief overview on this. Sure. So again, um, we have some single-story overlay neighborhoods and they are restricted to one story. Right. All of the other neighborhoods in this city are not restricted to one story. These guidelines provide the opportunity for architects, homeowners, and staff, and the board uh, to, um, and the, in, uh, to, in the IR process, to review modifications to existing Eichlers, be they one story in a single story overlay neighborhood, or two story in a non single story or second floor addition in a non single story overlay neighborhood. These are design guideline tools. They are not requirements. They are um, guidance for folks to, you know, know best practices on adding to an Eichler or, you know, um, yeah, but no, I just either lost, one or two stories. I lost my spot here, but I think it was saying that this does not, this in this particular area, it doesn't limit you to a certain style of house. Is that correct? Or do you still have to do Eichler type home? Okay, there's, these are not proposing you have to do anything. These are, these are, this is guidance. Um, the, only the council can put a mandatory uh, requirement. So that is for later uh, if the council directs mandatory compliance with these guidelines. We're not at that stage, Roger. We're just at the stage of looking at the guidelines and how they're set up and, and the content of the guidelines, not okay. the content of the zoning code. So I'm a little confused. So in other words, it, right now, at one point I read you said, this does not limit the house to one story, that two stories will be permitted is what it says in here at some point. So I guess you're not saying that still may not happen or is that, is that 
I guess I'm a little confused. It would be up to the council to direct staff to pursue uh, modifications to the zoning code. If council directs staff in March to pursue modifications to the zoning code, um, we would come back through a public hearing process with uh, those options. Right now, what we're looking at is options. So the council could direct us to, say, um, set up uh, Eichler overlay zones where, where neighborhoods could self-select to use these in a more um, rigorous manner. In other words, um, yeah. they self-select just like the single story overlay zones self-select mm -hmm. uh, to be one story. So uh, you, know, you could have an Eichler overlay zone that wants to have two stories. In fact, we do have a two story Eichler um, tract in Palo Alto, the yeah. Toria Court. Mm -hmm. They could select to be an Eichler overlay zone um, and they have two-story homes, so. So, so um, they meaning that particular neighborhood. Okay, so, are you, maybe I'm getting this confused. Are you, are you saying that the neighborhood itself can decide whether or not they're limiting to one or two-story homes? Yeah, and that's a different conversation than today's conversation right. because we're not at that point yet where we're talking about code changes. We're only talking about <laughs> guidelines which are different than code restrictions. Great. These are not restrictive. Okay. All right. Any it's advice. Okay. Any board member comments? Uh, Vice Chair Bauer. I have a couple of, of questions and um, about, well, about some of the language in here. On page 19 there's a discussion of the individual review process and guidelines and in the second paragraph it says that the single family individual review guidelines establish specific requirements. I won't read the whole thing. However, the IR process is not a design review process. In the next paragraph, it says that the single family individual review guidelines are one, to preserve unique character, promote construction, encourage respect for existing context. and. Those four, and there's another, there's, there are two more. These things, uh, I think, do, are exactly about design review. So I, I find the language in here confusing because on the one hand it says, no, this is not a design review process. And then in the next paragraph it says, these are the things that we're going to do when we look at your design. So I think that um, I, I'm not sure how to make it clearer and maybe it can't be clear, but if I'm confused by this, uh, a homeowner I don't think is gonna have an easy time of it either. Often confusion is the result of politics, um, and it's, it's no different for the individual review guidelines. They were, um, there was, when these came through, the, there was very strong statements that, you know, these are not design guidelines, these are not design guidelines, so they can never say that about themselves. Um, it's, it's a conundrum, but we are, we are just reviewing privacy, mass, and streetscape. We are not telling people this style of house, you need to do, you know, you've chosen this style of house, now you must do it well. You must do, you know, you can't do a turret on this house because you're not doing, you know, that Tudor style house. You, you know, it's very, it's very confusing for people because we aren't doing design review. We aren't making well-resolved houses, per se, in the d design chosen. We can give advice, which we do, but, um, you know, make or break, the findings for approval of individual review are about those three topics, I not love, about how well-designed a house is. I love those, I'm gonna, those are great. So, I love your words. Uh, uh, privacy, massing, and what, uh, those are, the focus of the IR program is privacy massing streetscape. So streetscape, we are looking perfect, to yeah, make yeah. sure that um, we are, you know, to the best of our ability, not introducing direct views perfect, of, perfect. yeah, for privacy. Massing being, you know, we have a neighborhood with, right. we're just trying to, you know, work on those for compatibility. Okay, yeah, and uh, that's always been my interpretation of uh, the IR process is yeah, exactly that, streetscape, privacy, and massing. That, that's what I, I tell everybody who asks me about that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I have a couple of other questions. Okay.
Sure. I also want to remind the board we've got two members of the public that want to speak on this topic also. Okay. Uh, go uh, ahead. At our, at our study session, I was um, encouraging Page and Turnbull to uh, reorganize the two charts on page 21 and 23, which show the i um tracks in the city, and have the IDs actually be um, age adjusted, not alphabetical because I think it will be more helpful to the community to understand where, uh, where each of these tracks was developed based on the beginning of the Eichler tracks uh, and, then, and then the end of that period. So it's the beginning is what, 51 and the end is 70 something, 74 I think. And I think that's just a reorganization of the chart. On the, um, on the flood hazard uh, map, page. which is page 23, I think it would be helpful to have the, the tracks that are actually affected by flood zone issues in a different color than the ones that are not. So on this map, all Eichler tracks are in orange. The national registered districts are in dark green. There are only two of them. But then there's this light blue flood plain or flood zone area. And so those tracks, and it's not clear to me whether it's, for instance, track 29 is in or out of that flood zone because it's right on the edge of the blue. It could be included. And this, obviously the purpose of this is to, um, again, to tell homeowners and anyone else who wants to know whether their, their uh, house is in a flood zone. And then the next question, or the next um, issue I'd like you to address, the staff, is if an Eichler track were included in a national registered district, it's my understanding that then the flood zone issues are not, are, are they're exempt from flood zone requirements or not? Yeah, so there's a, there's something called a, you know, a variance, it's not a variance, zoning variance, it's a variance from um, the public works requirements of to, to not, you know, um, build basements in a flood zone or what have you. So, um, and if it's a historic home, that's one of the um, you know, perks is that you can qualify for one of those variances. Um, uh, can, I, can we just go back for a moment to your earlier statement? I, I think that's great to to show the flood uh, the flood zone tracks as a different color from the non flood zone uh, for this map. I have a question. Though, so, uh, it appears that the flood zone maybe bisects a track. Would you uh, would you prefer that the whole track is colored uh, or you know reflect the because the, the flood zone is kind of shown the blue is shown there. Um, what what do you think? Well, I think it's uh, it, for the for the homeowners that are in the in say track 29, mm -hmm. maybe 25. I don't know whether mm. that one, yeah, and like 11 and 8, um, maybe 18, depending upon that what that little space is, um, because the blue doesn't actually blend into mm -hmm. the orange color. I would assume from looking at this map that yeah. say 29, 25, 8. Um, were exempt, but then there's 11, which is clearly partly in and maybe partly out, and eight, which looks like it's half in, half out. So a and color shading well. that puts those, you know, the, the planning department has to have the, the, the yeah. actual parcel numbers on the floodplain. But this is, a, this is kind of a broad overview for homeowners and real estate agents and people looking to buy property. And you ought to be able to tell fairly quickly by looking at this map whether you're in or out. Also, it seems to me, if, if and my next question, if in fact historic buildings or properties in an historic district are exempt from the FEMA um, requirements, that solves a problem that we have in this city where uh, how buildings, existing buildings that are renovated beyond 50% of value would have to be raised and that ruins the neighborhood context. Having one house up three and a half feet with a house next door being at, at current grade, um, that's a complaint we had at our study session from a member of the public who came and said, you know, 
people next door had to raise their house, they're looking in my windows. So this is one way of encouraging these districts to become registered as historic. And it also solves a zoning problem that, it, that is not easily solved any other way. So. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Bauer. I have a comment on the idea of, um, uh, I think it's good for property owners to certainly know if their parcel is in a flood zone. I'm gonna suggest that the uh, Eichler guidelines booklet would not be a good place to put that technical information because just as it was mentioned, uh, in, in one of these tracks, there may be one parcel that's in the flood zone, one parcel that's not in the flood zone. So it should not say track 29 is in a flood zone because you know that's not good information. Um, also, flood zones uh, can change. So if it gets um, memorialized in a book like this, and all of a sudden then um, the National uh, Flood Insurance uh, Program says, okay, this property is not, you know, then, then, then this is out of date. So I think the best source for a property owner to find out any uh, technical issues on flood zone is keep, just keep it where it is right now, and that's in the parcel maps, because those can be updated very quickly. This will not get updated very quickly, and this become out of date. So I think it's flood information is really critical for homeowners. So let's just keep, I would say that don't put it in this book, because this is not gonna get revised. Whereas the uh, uh, parcel reports that are available online in like, pretty quick, like instantly on a computer, I think that'd be the best place to keep flood zone, to address the issue of are you in a flood zone or not? And then, uh, then uh, if, as an applicant wants to make changes to their property that, you know, is in a flood zone or may, you know, let's make it real specific because this is not gonna be revised. So let me just respond to that very briefly. If in fact we, it's better not to have flood zone information in here, then let's take this map out. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose of the map. This page is only here to show people whether you're in and out. And so I, I'm just, I'm trying to make it clear. Clear, yeah. yeah. Um, I, t I take your point and you're absolutely right. Flood information is easily, Changeable. E it, it, well, not, not really. <laughs> It'll take 20, I'm, I'm in a flood zone, been there since 1998, and there's no hope in my lifetime that we're gonna be out of that flood zone because of the, how difficult it is to get the Army Corps of Engineers to move that. But, I think this, this is gonna be an online document. Printing the way we know it today is not really gonna be the way information is transmitted in the future. So, so I take your point, I take your point, but I think if we're gonna have this here, it ought to be clear, or maybe we don't have it, that's all. Um, I, I just think, you know, um, I think the map is helpful because people walking through this, but certainly could have a little script below there that says, this this is a fluid document that can. No pun, no pun intended. That's right. Okay. Yes. No. It's uh, it's water under the tree when the water. So on page. But I'm just saying there's that a little note there that says, by the way, this flood zone data gets changed on and off over the years. Verify and with the building department before. I think the map would be a helpful thing to at least get them understanding that they're in the flood zone if they don't already know. So. Yeah, I'll just weigh, weigh in on that. I, I think if we, it, it might be helpful to keep it, um, it, we can put the date, you know, as of t 2018, January or whatever, um, so they know, you know, and then the disclaimer subject to change. Yeah. Um, and then possibly to do a dashed line through, through the track showing course. approximately where that flood zone might help, um, you know. Yeah, if you say approximate. Right, and yeah. um, I, I would like to, to, to give credit to Paige and Turnbull. This box here on page 22 says, go, gives you exactly the, the uh, internet login, I mean, uh, direction to get to the flood zone information by parcel. So it's there. It would be better if you could put it on this, on the same page, but that's not really gonna be possible because of the way so they've, they've done a good job of putting this information. I just think that it could be a little bit better. Uh, before the HRB continues on this, like to, um, we've got uh, members of the public like to speak, like to hear uh, their words of um, comments, please. Uh, first speaker uh, would be uh, Lee Lippert. Welcome. Good morning, distinguished members of the Historic Resources Board. I'm Lee Lippert. I'm an architect in Palo Alto. I'm also the president of Past Heritage. I'm speaking tonight as an individual, not as 
speaking for the for past heritage. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your document. I think it's it's really well done. But the difficulty or challenge I see is implementation. And what you really need is a path forward as to how um, individual house owners as well as uh, homeowners as well as um, each of the neighborhoods will embrace this document. The problem is that uh, unfortunately with sea level rise and climate change, uh, moisture is not the friend of the Eichler. Uh, Eichlers are basically, and I use this, this is a uh, analogy, they're basically cardboard houses. And so they're really sub subject to moisture, dry rot, and uh, those sort of things. And uh, with sea level rise, uh, I can just see the, the problems, you know, it, you know, getting worse. Um, the, whole, the whole issue with the floodplain is one of very interesting complexity. Um, if a home is in the flood zone but it's not deemed historic, there's no way to sort of, sort of write it out of the flood zone. The house basically, if it exceeds 50% of the replacement valuation, um, needs to basically be lifted, the construction value. Um, however, if these homes were deemed historic and the only path to get there is by individual owners doing that, uh, they are subject to a number of incentives that they can take. One is that public works would deem it out of the flood zone and therefore certain work can be be performed on improving these buildings without uh, peril of that um, sort of tax, shall we say. Um, in, in, in other ways, they could make use of the State Historic Building Code in renovating their building. And uh, there are other incentives, I'm sure, as you know, coming down the, down the pike. Um, the failure of Eichler's is really in several different components. One are the beam overhangs. The beam overhangs are subject to dry rot and failure on the exterior. And the solution for that is that homeowners wind up cutting them off, thereby negating or losing some of the historic fabric right there. Uh, the second is in the siding. The siding is no longer available. You have to have it custom milled, but most homeowners, what they do is they simply rip off the siding and they uh, sheath it with plywood or, or a strand board, and then they simply go in and uh, cement plaster over it. And then the third area of failure are the garage doors. As you know, many Eichlers have those wonderful sliding uh, garage doors, and again, those get bound up in the tracks. The tracks are very old. They cut the tracks off. They remove the garage doors. And the next thing you know, you have a, uh, a sheet metal uh, roll-up overhead garage door. And uh, they're not particularly attractive. So if there's some way to incentivize citizens to be able to find a path forward to embrace your guidelines here, I think you'll begin to find that you'll be able to preserve many more Eichlers uh, in, the, in the neighborhoods. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for those uh, excellent comments. Next member of the uh, uh, public is uh, Mira Elderman, and welcome. Good morning. Thank you to the board and the committee, and thank you for all the work on the guidelines. They're really thorough, and I also really appreciate the community involvement. I'm an Eichler owner in Royal Manor, and before that, I was an Eichler owner in Willow Glen in San Jose for four years. I have deep respect for architect, uh, architectural um, beauty, and in, in, in my previous life, I was in Washington, D.C., where I had a historic residence where Harry Truman once lived. So I really support the attempt to protect privacy and continue to have good architecture in the Eichler neighborhoods. I want to discuss today section 5.1.1 on page 76. These are guidelines that talk about new additions to existing Eichlers, specifically with respect to first story additions. 
So I think this particular guideline would merit some more study. Um, it purports to put some limits on how additions to front and rear elevations of Eichlers can be done, and it includes three graphics. One with a green check mark, which I understand is probably a correct way to add a, add a rear addition, and then two with red X's, which seem to imply poor additions, one to the front, one to the back, although there's typo in the, in the third graphic. Um, as you know, there are a variety of Eichler designs. Some are flat front, some have certain offsets on the front of the house where one portion of the house is further back from the other. This is often divided where a garage might be further back or further forward from the living area of the house. Eichlers are small and lots are small in Palo Alto. And so we really need to allow owners to have the ability to add additions that are consistent with zoning regulations and architectural integrity to the front and the rear of their houses as they need them. There are Eichlers in some communities, including mine, where additions were added both to the front and the back, which are consistent with the original intent of the Eichler. And it, with the graphics and the text of this guideline might in the future be considered inconsistent. I will provide written comments and provide some addresses. Uh, one of the um, Eichlers that added a very beautiful rear, rear addition was actually on the San Mateo house tour, which I know is not within these guidelines control, uh, but it was on the house tour and was done absolutely beautifully by an architectural firm. Um, rear, guide, rear additions in particular, I think, should have a very soft touch in these guidelines because most Eichlers are completely fenced off from the front and we're interested in protecting the privacy of the backyard and owners who want to add additions to the backyard, which is almost always the only place where there is room to add an addition, are not even seen from the street. And with a first story addition, even if you're putting up walls of glass in the back, you're not going to be intruding on the privacy of any of your neighbors because of the way the fences are. And in the front of the house, often when you have an offset front of a house, you can add an addition about six feet to the side of the house that is set back from the road further than the other side to bring the house flat to the front which is also consistent with several Eichler designs, uh, both designs where there's a flat front of the house or where a courtyard has been added where a fence goes to the front of the house, you have a flat front. So those are my two comments on the uh, guidelines for the additions to the front and the back. Um, I think there's also um, a beautiful addition with a rear addition in Green Meadow. I'll find the address for that one. And again, there's also one in my Royal Manor neighborhood that did a front addition that is quite beautiful. Thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate all the attention that has been given to this and hope that we have some really great outcomes for the owners that truly love our homes. Thank you so much. Okay, and any other members of the public like to speak on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none. Uh, bring it back to the board. Additional uh, comments, um, words, suggestions from board members? Uh, board member McKinnon. I just had one thought here. Uh, you, you emphasize that this is a, a guideline and not a prescriptive uh, situation right here. Uh, it might be interesting if there was an incentive that was attached to this, that if you follow these guidelines, you get some type of incentive. Uh, I don't know what it would be, maybe additional size or square footage or something that you could do. but make it more of a voluntary type of thing and not prescriptive, but you might get more interest in it, incentivize it. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. The uh, board members have repeatedly commented about uh, what can be put in any guideline, including any ordinances, uh, for incentives. Um, uh, incentives can be, and, th and those can be based on a voluntary basis, uh, but uh, if you follow the money, then, then you might choose to take care, to do the incentive. Um, so I think, th and we've heard a member from the public speak the idea of uh, incentives. So if somehow that can be incorporated somehow in guidelines and maybe in, if, if ordinances uh, uh, become uh, uh, in place regarding guide ICAR guidelines, um, I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah, I, I just, when I look at this, I think anybody who is a person looking at this as a, as a guidance would eventually assume that it was going to be prescriptive at some point. 
you know, if you went to all the trouble to, to build this guideline. But if you clearly made it as an incentive program, it would sort of remove that possibility and put it more as an incentive type program. I think that's a, a, a common voice that the squire has sung about uh, just uh, in, if it, wherever opportunities are to provide incentives, um, whether it's guidelines or ordinances, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Well, I've got uh, several things to, to look at. Um, let's start on page um, uh, 24. And on page 24 on the right hand side, it talks about National Register um, uh, Historic Places and Districts. Uh, my question is, is only the district historic and not individual homes? So individual homes are not historical properties. Is that, is that correct to date as we are, as where we are today? Yeah, the, the National Register forms for both of those National Register districts um, are focused on the, the um, tract as a whole. Okay. Um, yeah. The significance derives from, uh, you know, arrangement uh, on the on the sites, and you know, it's kind of a holistic look okay. at it. There may be some uh, um, homes out there that qualify individually, but mm -hmm. they have not been identified in either of those okay, nomination right. forms. Okay. See so your lights on. Yeah, typically, uh, Christina Dykes, Page and Turnbull. Um, typically, contributors to the historic districts are considered historic resources uh, for other purposes that you might have in the city. So the next page has the, the maps that color them with contributors and non-contributors to help differentiate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, and then the contributors. Um, so uh, I guess uh, from the ordinance point of view, are they considered historic properties on the from the historic preservation ordinance? Our preservation ordinance does not address National Register District uh, uh, Eichler track, so the ordinance has nothing to do with um, that at okay. this point. At this point. Yeah, yeah okay. that's a discussion that could happen in the future as far as, um, you know, the relationship between contributors to a district and our ordinance. Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, and I do see that actually on page 27, the, on the, the right-hand side near the bottom, it, I'll just read it, it says, National Register Historic Districts are not currently listed in the city's historic resources inventory. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Next is um, page, flipping it there, on page uh, 64. My comment is, um, it talks about exterior colors. So that's uh, 4.1.2 on page 64. Um, so I read this, then uh, color, that's not an enforceable um, guideline. It's not enforceable, right, color. This is page 64. Oh, my question, so it looks like uh, colors, th that's not enforceable. Anyone can paint any color they want. There is nothing in our code uh, regarding colors of any, uh, you know, prescriptive of any right. home anywhere in the city. Okay. Um, these, these are, um, you know, the, the architectural control committees that are in place in two of the, or three, two, three, of the district, two of the districts, uh, or sorry, of the um, Eichler tracks. They do employ discussions with, or at least I think uh, Green Meadow uh, Architectural Control Committee has discussions with homeowners um, about the color, you know, traditional Eichler colors. Okay. okay. But these are not intended to be um, prescriptive. Okay. It, 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 it actually says right here the, the use of specific original colors is not required in Eichler neighborhoods. Okay. Fine. Or whatever that's worth. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Next on page 72. And mechanical systems. Um, again, it looks like it just, uh, it's just a, a guideline that uh, if you're going to put ductwork on the building just to have it minimally visible from the street. I think it just says it. So it's, I support that idea as a guideline. Okay. Hey, please, uh, Vice Chair Bauer. So I'd, I'd just like to put into the record um, something that I think a lot uh, uh, occurs often. Um, and that is that the mechanical companies don't, because they don't have the aid of a mechanical engineer to design these mm. HVAC systems, 
that they typically just put round ducts everywhere. In HVAC systems, the primary consideration is the number of square inches or volume of air you move through a duct. And it doesn't matter whether it's round or rectangular. There's a little bit of drag in rectangular. But rectangular ducting would diminish the impact of these systems hugely. So I'm encouraging people somehow to to think about that and maybe even put something in this document that talks about that. Yeah. That's actually a good point. I'm, I'm imagining this scenario. Homeowner, um, their um, steel hydronic he heating, heating system fails and then they just uh, call directly a mechanical contractor. Says, hi, can you give us a price? Uh, we need duct work up with here. And then uh, um, I guess my question is um, for um, Eichler guideline, is there any Let's see, what would encourage or let the mechanical contractor when it comes to get a permit? Uh, is there any um, at the development center saying, oh, your Eichler, please consider rectangular ducts versus, what's the mechanism between the contractor and the owner so that the contractor knows about this concern? Uh, or is it just a, a permit, you know, says I'll put round ducts, he gets a permit and gets installed and that's it without any interface with these guidelines at all. Is there any process of how that, to speak to uh, Vice Chair Bauer's uh, good comment? Well, you know, once the council uh, adopts a, the guidelines in whatever form they do adopt them, um, okay. there's opportunities for training of the development center staff so they can at least um, have a conversation uh, you know, the, the planning, certainly sure. the planners that are over there will will receive firm instructions. Um, sure, yeah. And then, you know, but people do walk in and do things at the counter, over the right. counter yeah. all the time. Yeah. This is probably just a straight, right now, it's probably just a straight building permit issue. I mean, there's not going to be, I don't, so far, it won't be any planning issue. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so just a good comment about uh, how to, uh, uh, before a permit is issued, you know, how can it get addressed to what these guidelines are saying? Right process question. Good question. Okay, next is um, on page, about three more items here. On page uh, 77, uh, and one of the speakers uh, made reference to page 77. Um, take a look at the, uh, the middle diagram where it says a no with the, uh, the uh, addition uh, beyond the uh, side, side view there. Um, there's another page, I think it's on page 104, where it talks about uh, the idea of uh, any addition, um, it's encouraged it to be subordinate to the main uh, existing house. There can be an addition, as on page 77, the middle diagram, where it extends back there. But as long as it's subordinate, there could be fencing that, that's not visible. So um, I think that can be achievable to allow for that kind of a, an addition and still have it being subordinate without affecting the historical aspect. So um, and again, this, and part of the flexibility that the, one of the last speakers mentioned, I think that would be good to incorporate. So as long as it's subordinate, because that is one of the guidelines, is that whatever addition happens, it's, that it's subordinate to the existing house. Um, the middle diagram on page 77, then that could be a yes. Thank you. I think um, we can we can certainly take that middle diagram and have it focused on how how to be subordinate. What are Perfect. the you know bullets that that make it subordinate? Maybe per so people Perfect. can understand visually sure. how that how that can. Take that place. sounds great. Yeah. And then that last speaker also made, made a, um, uh, uh, a typographical error on the on page seventy seven on the on the right hand diagram it says inappropriate rear. So just this should be inappropriate front. On the, uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, okay, yeah, she's got it, okay, good. Okay, and then uh, as the last speaker also mentioned, yeah, some kind of flexibility of, um, you know, if, uh, again, these are all subject to a reviewing body, I believe, right? Uh, whenever anyone, I guess not, okay. It sounds like uh, if a homeowner wants to make an addition, it's, again, these aren't registered historic properties, so I guess none of the projects would come before the HRB. Okay, right, okay, right, yeah. Uh, uh, Vice uh, uh, Board Member Kohler, yes. Yeah. Um, just in the comment about the no in the middle where it says X, the no in the back. You know, all the Eichlers have these six 
put fences everywhere. Who's going to see that in the back, and what difference does it make? That, that's why I made that comment about, uh, you know, how, anyway, but the idea of uh, subordinate, and then, um, uh, so there's the notes there. Good, yeah, good comment, Board Member Colder. And I would just add to this conversation about the rear additions. I mean, we do have that, um, I don't think it's called an incentive, but we have that ability to encroach into the 20-foot rear setback Correct, yes. with, uh, you know, across half the width of the house or half right. the, you know, that dimension at uh -huh. the rear for a distance of six feet. So we could actually have several diagrams that could help sure. people understand how to use the code to, to make the backyard, uh, at least for one-story additions, a, a good, good place to start. Sure, um, yeah. Vice Chair Bauer. So I think what we're talking about um, as we review these diagrams uh, is that effectively it's only a front facade protection that we're seeking. I mean, of course we want to preserve as much of the building, original building as we can. That's, the, that's a, one of the Secretary of Interior's primary standards in any addition or renovation. But the reality is because of fencing, we can't see the backyards unless we're actually invited in by the homeowners. And so I think that, uh, again, any uh, series of, of um, sketches that would allow what you were, you were just describing, which is the encroachment issue, is probably not an X as the center one, but maybe a question mark. Yeah. It's nuanced. And so I think that's to be encouraged. I think obviously the right hand diagram where there's a front um, addition is completely problematic in preserving the design and um, also I think it's unlikely a lot of well it depends upon the era of the Eichler track but most of them were built on the front setback so I don't know that there's any exemption for front setback intrusion so. Again, these are and, and these are guidelines, and then so someone can propose something, and then uh, as, as the as the neighborhood review. Okay, and my last comment is on page uh, 103. I'll oh, wait till you guys finish. Uh, page, page 103, and the uh, diagram about the uh, the knob handle um, with a um, aging population. Knobs are going to be pretty difficult. It can be a challenge for a lot of people. So uh, in the middle of the page on 71.3, it says retain original door hardware knob. Um, I'm gonna suggest um, that there be, you know, don't put that in a, uh, in a guideline that could perhaps become prescriptive. Um, uh, yeah. Hot knobs are pretty, can be challenging for people with, as, as, we, as we age. So I'm concerned about uh, putting that in a, in a guideline and, and certainly if a guideline becomes prescriptive. Can I just make a quick comment on the guidelines becoming prescriptive? Sure. Um, if the council directs us to have prescriptive uh, anything, um, it, it wouldn't necessarily follow that everything that's in print in here is prescriptive. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, anyways, that's a conversation for another time. But. All right. Um, I just I just noticed that about uh, the it says re retain original knob and uh, anyway, so just, just a, as a comment for uh, accessibility. Okay. Yeah. Those are all the comments I had. Uh, uh, Board Member McKinnon. Uh, just one further comment on page seventy-two. Uh, we did have some discussion about heating systems, and if you put some of these ductworks on top of the roof, it's pretty unsightly. And uh, that, that is addressed kind of in a soft manner right here where it, the third bullet, the second bullet down on the, on the right hand side, explore ductless heating and cooling systems such as mini split mm -hmm. or conditioning units. I think this should probably be emphasized more as being a really a practical solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. I, I personally have used these things mm -hmm. for the last 10 years. And, couple projects we had and they really work out quite effectively and Excellent. you get rid of a lot of that unsightliness and it solves a very significant yeah. problem when you have uh, heating tubes embedded in concrete floors you can get around it with this new, newer system newer technologies and the, these many split systems they have you can do several rooms right now with one 
condenser. So I, I think that should be kind of highlighted as a, a major improvement. To uh, can I ask you, are they reversible? So I know that you can cool with split yes, systems. Yes, you can do. You, you can, can heat with them too. You can do, they have a system I put in recently, a hyper system that's good, not around here, but it's good to minus 20 degrees. It extracts heat. Fred, any other comments on the uh, guidelines? I, I had one other comment that wasn't covered um, on page 67 um, on the improving the energy efficiency of a house by repairing or upgrading windows. I, I, in general, I like all the, all this in here, but there was, I never saw anything about trying to match the materials, so it would be nice to incorporate something in the materials. There's a lot about size um, and profile, but nothing about, um, nothing about materials, so I would encourage people not to replace wood with vinyl and mm. aluminum, yes. that sort of thing, right? Okay. Okay. I, I did, couldn't find it, but maybe. Okay. It's in the middle of page, it's that middle uh, column on page 66. It says new vinyl windows are discouraged as our aluminum. Uh, oddly enough, of course, aluminum was the original Eichler uh, yeah. st window style. <laughs> but it doesn't mean any en energy codes now, so I don't even know if you can still buy them. I mean, you can't certainly buy them at Home Depot or Lowe's. But anyway, uh, uh, good point. Um, you. Yeah, it's an important point to make. Hey, any other uh, comments from the board or staff on this agenda item? Uh, uh, Council Member Holman. Yeah, I have a question. I'll save my comments on the guidelines for uh, later and otherwise. Um, just one, oh, one comment, though, about the schedule. Actually, it's a question. I'm not understanding the schedule because it says that the public comment period ends on the 12th, but the community workshop is, you said on the 18th now has been confirmed? <clears throat> yes, the, the comment period is, the, is really the initial, kind of like a CEQA, initial comment period where we're asking people to get us the comments so we can prepare for that workshop on the 18th. Um, and, you know, the comments continue on the 18th, which is, yes, the targeted date we get a little worried about this, you know, when is the state of the city going to be? And so we were kind of looking at two possible dates, but we've landed on the 18th and hope that the state of the city is in on another date. Um, so that's the, that's the point. And then we will continue to get comments um, on, the, on the 18th and work that into a revised set of guidelines after, after that. Okay. So on the 18th, then, you will have compiled the comments received by the 12th or... The reason I'm asking is because we're, we're getting a lot of comments from the public about, council members are, about schedules. And like there's been an RPP meeting schedule for December 20, for instance, we're getting a lot of pushback on that and a lot of, I mean, understandably. Um, but there's a lot of comment these days about meeting schedules. And so I'm just wondering how that was going to work. You've sort of explained how that would. So would the comments received by the 12th be compiled in for the meeting on the 18th? Uh, able to review so we'll do our best depends on the extent of the comments received on the 12th so far we haven't gotten anything so I don't know what's going to come into my email box um, or the, the we have an iClear inbox um, that people okay. can send comments okay. to that I look at that we both um, will look at and then we'll have yeah some kind of list of what you know or description in that mm -hmm. in that meeting of what we've heard to date from the HRB from others okay um, yeah. I Based on history, I think you're more likely to get more comments on the 18th than you are by the 12th, probably. Hoping that people do come to the to the event. Yes. Yeah, and then um, so the meeting is on the 18th, and then um, those comments you're going to compile and bring to the HRB back to the HRB on the 25th. Do I read that right? Uh, well, not necessarily. Um, the a the ARB is making their comments today. They can recommend um, recommend what they recommend today. If that's an option. Um, the 25th, we were going to start to talk about these um, code, potential code changes that we would, uh, we're, ex you know, exploring discussions of that to get, you know, to start that conversation. Um, based on the, based on the comments received by the 18th. Uh, and other, and just looking at codes and how our codes function. For instance, we have our um, chapter 1812 that, um, doesn't mention the Eichler guidelines because, uh, and they also don't mention the Professorville guidelines mm -hmm. at all. So um, that's a code change, for instance, that's an easy code change, I think, to, to talk about the existence of both sets of guidelines. 
that the council could then say yes, talk about the guidelines in the in the zoning code about residential. Okay. Then there'll be other potential options such as mentioned the Eichler optional, you know, um, overlay if, if you want to call it that, com uh, you know, combining district or conservation district, mm -hmm. however, you know, the, the council directs staff to explore that. Okay, that clarifies th helpfully. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Bauer, you had a suggestion. So uh, if, if we're finished with this phase of um, uh, discussing the guidelines, I would like to propose to board members that we continue this discussion until the 25th of January, or at least until after the, the, the last public input meeting, which I think is on the January 16th or 18th. It's, it's in. Well, so yeah, January 18th is the, is the, is now we've landed on that um, with our fingers crossed that nothing bumps it. Yes. Well, but that's the next public meeting. That's the public workshop, yeah, the right. workshop. Okay, I, I think we can't make, as a board, we should not make the decision, we could, but I think it would be unwise to make a decision about this and move this forward in the regulatory scheme until we actually hear that last meeting. I've been to one meeting, the very first one. It was um, very strong opinions on both sides of uh, whether or not there should be any guidelines. And so I think after this information is, is um, now, why, widely available for the public. I'd like to hear what the public has to say. So, I'm uh, recommending we continue this until. That, that's great. After um, that meeting. If there, are, if what has been said by the board or the public today, if there's discussion about that, um, as far as straw poll or anything else, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I haven't heard anyone saying I don't agree with that uh, when another member has spoken. But we can certainly, you know, because we'd like to get. Uh, board concurrence at some point on uh, the changes that have been voiced today. Okay. I have one sort of comment. <laughs> okay. Have you noticed the uh, <clears throat> choice of colors for houses lately, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> white. Okay. White all yeah. outside, white all inside. Yeah, it's, we're seeing, we are seeing a lot of that. It's, it's just, I just, yeah. Uh, but uh, we even did our house and yeah, okay. we never even talked about it. But I'm just saying, is it mentioned in here, color? Of yeah, the color, color is mentioned and there are guidelines for color. There are, yeah. They're it, guidelines, but does that's that, right. they're you do a white eye color? They're only guidelines. They're, they're not enforceable. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, following up on the board met Vice Chair Bauer's uh, comment, um, uh, so that's to have uh, continue again. So I guess that could just show up on, an, on, on a subsequent agenda item after the public hearing. If you'd like to continue it to the 25th, that's the, that's the uh, you know, we, we wouldn't talk about it on the 11th because that's before, right. so we can yeah. continue it to that date if you'd like. Okay, good. Um, uh, board agree? Okay. Yeah. Sure. I, I also think it would be important to have all seven board members here to move this forward. That'd be wonderful. Good. <laughs> good. Okay. Anything else on this agenda item? Okay, I'm going to suggest uh, for the next, let's take a 10-minute uh, break so we can set up for the uh, next uh, agenda item. Uh, so we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. That's at uh, 9.52. Okay, great. Okay, thank you.
board members are ready. That's what not. Uh, okay, we're going to actually um, um, we're going to go a little bit out of order. We're going to uh, finish off the um, agenda item five, which is approval of minutes first, before we go back to item number four. Is there a motion to approve or amend the minutes of November 9th? So moved. Okay, uh, please go ahead, Board Member McKinnon. Uh, uh, page. Uh, page 22 of the packet. If you refer to uh, the bottom paragraph. There's no page 20. Uh, we, need, we need packet page. Packet page 22. Now, uh, it's a package 50 something, right? Uh, Here, right there. Packet. Packet page 22. Oh my gosh. What? Yeah. So, the, so, so he's looking at the excerpt minutes for the Eichler guidelines, and then there's the full oh, minutes at the back. I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, I see. I'm on page 22. Yes. Okay. Uh, the bottom paragraph where there were some quotes made, uh, the bottom two lines. It says, Wright was greatly influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. That should read Eichler was greatly influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. And strike out the word that. And the genius of all these Eichlers was Frank Lloyd Wright. So delete the word that and then substitute Eichler for Wright. Down here. I'll we'll so read properly. Page seven. Okay. Any other amendments? Okay. All right. Anything else? For uh, there's been a motion. Is is there a second to the uh, motion, including the amendments? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not going to be voting. I was not in attendance of this meeting. Uh, all those who did attend, vote by signal I or nay for the I. Okay. That passes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, next is agenda item number four. I will uh, read the agenda item and then I'll make an announcement. Agenda item number four, uh, study session, 755 Hamilton Avenue, request for study session for, of an individual review application for a uh, second story addition to a single story home. Zone district R1, uh, single family um, environmental assessment pending. Uh, I'm the architect of record, so I will uh, be stepping down from this agenda item, and uh, Vice Chair Bauer will uh, convene the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Staff has a presentation. Yeah, I'll let uh, Martin get settled. And... Oh, oh, I guess um, we could go ahead and start with a staff presentation. Sure. Okay, good morning, everyone. So I'm just gonna provide a little bit of background information on what makes this home uh, historic, a historic resource, as well as providing some uh, images of the existing and proposed elevations. So 755 Hamilton was built around 1920. It is considered an archetypal example of the California bungalow. It is a one-story wood frame home clad in stucco with a low pitched roof and recessed front porch. Principal stylistic features of the house are the tapered porch columns, moderately overhanging eaves, exposed rafter tails, multiple gables, and the tapered brick chimney. Additionally, the home is significant for its association with Ralph Beale, a leader in early electronics industry in Palo Alto, who made significant contributions to mil American military technology in World War I and II. You can see a picture of him uh, in the upper right um, uh, corner. So Ralph Beale and his wife, Merle, uh, were the first occupants and first owners of 755 Hamilton, which was built by Beale's father-in-law, George Birch. <laughs> Beale worked for the Federal Telegraph Company from 1912 to 1926 and was an outstanding leader and authority on radio research and television. 
According to Ward Winslow, Beale and two others worked out the theory of the great arcs that Federal Telegraph built to become the backbone of the U.S. Navy communications during World War I. 755 Hamilton has been deemed eligible for the National Register of Historic Places under criteria B and C as the home of a leader in early electronics and as an archetypal example of the California bungalow, respectively. So we're going to run through just a few more pictures of the exterior uh, and floor plan, as well as um, existing floor area sizes. And here are the, the existing elevations. And we can always go back to these if you want to look at it further. Oh, existing and new, excuse me. Okay. This would be the rear of the home. And this is the north side. And here is the uh, garage. Okay. So the garage is currently the car garage? Right, so the garage, uh, the garage is going to be uh, proposed for, I guess, demolition and then uh, building a much smaller um, garage on the same footprint. Uh, so that is, that is kind of a brief background of this project. Uh, we have Hallie King here, who is the project planner for this, uh, who can help answer questions. Uh, and I think that's it from staff. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Emily. Um, typically, we would now hear from the applicant um, architect and then uh, uh, there are no, at least to date, uh, there are not yet any um, public, um, any members of the public who want to speak to this, but that might change. So Martin, if you're ready, then please um, review the project. Great. Thank you, Vice Chair Bauer and members of the HRB and staff. I'm Martin Bernstein, architect. Um, uh, just as uh, for members of the public to know, it's, uh, I received notice from the California Fair Political Practice uh, Commission um, that as I am the architect of record and without employees, I'm uh, permitted by um, that commission to uh, uh, present this project to the uh, Historic Resources Board. I want to start by um, making a, a simple statement about uh, the goals uh, for um, the homeowners and the owners are here to answer any other questions. Also, it would be uh, Fan Yang and Wee Tan and uh, owner's representative uh, Nick French. Uh, as far as the goal, it is to create for contemporary use a three generation family home. There'll be three generations uh, living in this home. And uh, that important family goal is um, the reason for the proposed design you're seeing today. Two other goals. We want to uh, maintain eligibility for the National Register of Historic Places and consequently the, subsequently the California Register of Historic Places and keep the existing basement. This project uh, and application also includes uh, requesting a variance and that variance is to keep the existing basement. The uh, National Flood Insurance Program uh, allows for, and that's in um, the, uh, the Palo Alto Code and also the uh, federal guidelines, is that uh, if a structure is specifically uh, eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and if it's uh, deemed to continue with that eligibility, that the existing basement can remain. So that's, uh, and that re requires just then uh, a variance procedure for that. Um, so that is uh, specifically, th those are the exact words in the um, uh, National Flood Insurance Program that if it's a eligible for national, then the basement can stay in the flood program. Uh, we are also asking for a home improvement exception, and that is to, um, uh, the ceiling is uh, low. The, the, the main rooms inside the, the existing house, they're very expansive. I've been, I've been in the house several times, as you can imagine, um, and it feels very compressive. Uh, and eight, eight foot six. And the home improvement exception we're looking for is to raise that ceiling six inches to get to a nine foot ceiling. I, uh, and six inches will make a difference on how that feels. The reason that we would need a home improvement exception is you can see on one of the documents that you have, the, uh, the, on the Fulton Street, the building is 15 feet, 10 inches from the property line and the side setback is 16 feet. So we are two inches into that, into that setback 
And then so to raise that up six inches, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, we have to go through the, uh, the formal home improvement exception to raise it six inches um, or two inches away from the sideline there. Okay. Um, aspects that are certainly important to the Historic Resources Board would be the um, secret, I'm sorry. I, uh, I need to ask you a question before you get too far. The, the, the raising, what is being raised? The uh, first floor ceiling height is, we want to raise that six so inches. So does the rafters stay? In the the, uh, we're looking at, um, the, so the rafters are uh, two by uh, eight. Yeah, so we raise those rafters up six inches. We, so yeah. the, the, the height of the roof and everything from the exterior is raising up? Six inches, correct, yes. Okay. Thank you. Other aspects that are certainly important to the Historic Resources Board would be um, conformance with, substantial conformance with the Secretary of Interior Standards. And um, uh, so those are, I'll speak briefly about compatibility and differentiation and massing. Um, I will say and compliment the process of the uh, individual review process and, um, and then also historic review. Um, we and I personally feel this, is that I think uh, based on the comments I received from um, historic planner Vance and uh, IR consultant Mamorella, and then also with the guidance of uh, planner King, um, and then you'll see, so I'll mention some of the improvements we've made based on that, is um, how do we get maintaining the historical quality? And as far as compatibility, and you'll see in the, uh, the, the perspective renderings that are in front of you, the, um, uh, the second floor addition uh, certainly has the same characteristics as the, uh, the historic first floor. The differentiation, and this is where I took some good counsel from um, um, historic planner Vance, is you'll see in the packet there, there are some other photographs in the back of the uh, existing brackets of the roof, and it shows a certain little profile on there. Um, for the second floor uh, brackets, uh, those will just be um, kind of square and cut off and won't have all the finesse that the historic ones do. So that'd be an example of the differentiation. As far as the uh, massing, um, we took good counsel again from um, uh, IR consultant Mamorella, and that is uh, we reduced the uh, Fulton Street length of the second floor. We also moved it farther away from Fulton Avenue, and then we put a couple of cut cutouts um, on the back and, and the front. Um, as, and, and, include, and, and then lowering the, uh, the plate height so that um, you'll see on those perspective drawings uh, from the street point of view how it um, uh, minimizes the uh, impact of that mass. So again, we just took good counsel. I took good counsel from uh, those uh, great, great comments. You also see in the packet uh, from the, um, uh, and you've got these pictures in front of you, of uh, examples of craftsman style and two-story homes with a lot of different setbacks. Um, you can see the first two pages just shows examples of two stories in through there and then little shed dormers. The um, uh, next three and four pages that you have in front of you are showing the, the renderings of the proposed addition. You'll see the bracket details of existing. Very good. And then on the, uh, this rendering here you have of uh, showing a different dormer options. Um, one of the comments that came out during the individual review with um, historic planner Vance was uh, one idea to help break the um, uh, mass of the second floor. And again, and that's subject to a HRB comment, of course. Uh, you can see option A and option B are the two different ways. Um, my renderings are showing option A because uh, my thinking is that that's the least, um, least of adding mass to it, but uh, looking forward for your comments on all that. And other aspects that I think are important for the Historic Resources Board would be uh, as far as the keeping historic character and, and content. And that is the, um, uh, uh, the first floor windows on facing Fulton and the first floor windows facing Hamilton unchanged. So uh, the first floor, um, any of those, those, char those character defining aspects are completely um, remaining in place. Um, we're not raising the floor of the building uh, above any higher because uh, uh, the, the general guidelines for the historic preservation point of view is you know, don't lift the building. Um, so, that's, so that's, and then we wanna keep that basement because again, the variance allows us to apply for that, so. 
Um, there will be comments of, uh, and then we can go over the, um, uh, the standards for rehabilitation. You see that in the staff report about some items that are consistent and some items that are not consistent. Um, those uh, comments were based on previous plans. Um, the current plans you have now are, are, will be addressing some of these items since you're here. The, um, uh, I also want to make a point is that when we talk about massing, um, certainly the extra elevations are not how a building is viewed because those are drawn as you're at, at infinity, so the heights are there. So the idea of perception is, what does it look like from the street point of view? And that's why I provided those, uh, uh, those, those renderings. Um, if at the board's leisure, we can just go through the, um, uh, on page, uh, packet page 32, I, if, if, it's, if it pleases the board, I can just go over briefly a comment and response to the comments that are on the standards. Is that acceptable to the board? So. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll start on packet page 31. A property shall be used for its historic purpose, and that is, con so this project is considered consistent. Number two, the historic character of the property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alterations uh, uh, sh shall be avoided. Um, this is saying and not consistent. That was a previous plan, and you'll see the explanation talks about uh, the windows. The current plans have no change to the existing windows on the uh, street-facing facades. Uh, it was discussed during our historic review, uh, preliminary meeting with uh, historic planner Vance, uh, that there wasn't much concern expressed regarding the uh, uh, the inboard side side property windows changing because those are never visible from the public street, and then the rear um, that was a minimal uh, impact on the, vi on the from the street point of view. So the windows again on um, Fulton and Hamilton are completely unchanged, and so that'd be the response to the uh, making it consistent with the uh, standard number two. Number three. Each property should be recognized, physical place and time, changes that create a false sense of historical development. Again, um, earlier plans uh, talked about the, um, uh, the scale and mass of the second floor. Again, uh, through the uh, good counsel from Marmorella, we reduced the, um, uh, the length of the wall on Fulton Street and also on Hamilton by setting back. The floor plans show where those things are set back and cut back. Uh, to reduce uh, that, that mass. So that addresses the uh, consistency issue for number three. Number four, uh, properties change over time. That's consistent. Uh, number five, distinctive features. Um, uh, it says explanation, floor modifications include changing the number, location, size of glazing and windows. Um, the current plans you have now show no change to those existing windows for that issue. Uh, standard number six, not applicable. Uh, number seven, not applicable. Number eight, significant architectural resources affected. That's consistent. Number nine, new additions, alterations uh, shall be differentiated from the old. Explanation of, uh, of this on this on page now 34, packet page, says the addition appears to duplicate the exact form and then the current plans based on the good advice from and counsel from Marmorella is that we've made um, uh, changes to the uh, form and, and the shape of the building here. Um, and then also with the, uh, the brackets uh, being, um, or simplified versions so that they're not confused with the historic issue. And then number 10, new additions related, new constructions be undertaken in a manner removed in the future. The proposed project could have a permanent impact because adding a second floor. Oh, actually it talks about the uh, proposed increase in wall height. Um, uh, so the increase of height in six inches. Um, that six inches is gonna be within the shadow lines of these, uh, we've got like 30 inch overhangs in through here. So if that went up six inches, um, my uh, suggestion is that um, by the time you get the, the, uh, the second floor addition, that um, uh, that will not be a perceived change in the historical quality, uh, but it will affect the, uh, and improve the, uh, the interior uh, view here. I did want to also include on the very last page, uh, this is um, uh, a project one block away on 811 Hamilton Avenue. Uh, the, re the reason I'm bringing up this is uh, this building has been remodeled. Um, 
It was a one-story building. It was designed by uh, Willis Polk, a significant architect. Um, the uh, no existing historic fabric was retained. It was or removed. The um, I know this house quite well. I'm, it's lived in the neighborhood. The uh, front entry columns used to be these um, these uh, appropriately scaled because Willis Polk was a genius at this of uh, like 14 inch uh, door columns into there. And now we've got like, um, uh, you know, 10 inch columns. Um, uh, so those were demolished, thrown away. I don't, I, I, I talked to the development team, they weren't even salvaged. The, um, all the existing windows were removed and then you got that second floor massing on there. So uh, uh, Willis Polk's uh, genius of a design was um, abandoned. Um, and so just, just for factual information and that's, so I took counsel from that before this project got started on uh, how do we keep the historic integrity of, of that first floor and then having a compatible second floor. Uh, again, addressing all the IR issues and certainly the, uh, um, uh, the el eligibility issue, which is important. The eligibility issue is uh, important uh, because that uh, allows then for us to apply for the variance for keep, keeping the basement. Um, so, summarizing, um, it's the idea of uh, perception of what will this look like from the street point of view, and that's why I provided those uh, renderings. Um, uh, um, and it's our suggestion as um, the applicant that um, this does meet all the criteria for the variance. Um, and then uh, the home improvement exception, we're looking for your comments on that. And then um, any other comments you have. Um, Available to speak to us would be, speak to you would be also then the owners or the owner's representative as questions come up. So I'm here to answer any technical issues as architect of record, then any life quality issues then the homeowners can address your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's a lot of material to cover. And um, I'd just like to remind my fellow board members, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a study session, so we're not going to come to any conclusions today. We want to give um, the um, owners and, and their architect feedback on the design. So um, questions anybody has or comments? Brandon? Um, can you explain the, the, I'm a little confused on, uh, on the height, on the, the six inches versus a foot versus a foot and a half. There's a lot of the just, it says the wall, the wall plate's going to raise a foot and then the second floor framing's on top, but it's six inches to the, for the, for the eaves. Can you just explain that? Yeah, there was a uh, original um, uh, suggestion that uh, the, that the interior uh, ceiling goes from uh, eight foot six to 10 feet high. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's from a spatial point of view, that would be a good thing from a spatial point of view. Um, but that's, uh, that's changing the historical aspect. So again, there was an earlier set of plans, not the current set of plans. The earlier set of plans Got was it. one foot high. So now, uh, so we're only proposing now to go six inches higher. So everything would move up the ceiling and the, the, the eaves would move up six inches. Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So following, can I make a comment about this? Or I, I it's a really ask a question. Um, so by raising the first floor ceiling height to, by six inches, you're going to be in, um, encroaching on the daylight plane on the right side of the building as you face it from the street, is that right? Uh, I believe not. Let me look at the uh, diagram here. Um, uh, no, if you look on page uh, A4.1, yeah. there'll be a no daylight, int daylight plane intrusion. Oh, so six inches and you're, you're still under the daylight plane. Correct. Right? So I, I thought earlier in your, early in your presentation, you said you were applying for a variance. Uh, homeowner improvement, that's the improvement except because um, that wall is 15 foot 10 from the, from the Fulton Street set setback, not 16 feet. So we want to make, so that's two inches intrusion, so it's a two inch nonconformance. So we want to make that wall two inches, six inches higher. So that's technically at making a non-conforming wall even taller. I see. So you're not you're not encroaching on the daylight plane. You're still inside that. Correct. Plane. Yeah. There's no there is no intrusion in the daylight planes on this project. Okay. Ben? Where's my? 
Great. Um, is, was that all uh, the comments you had? Um, let, me, let me let me collect my thoughts. I just wanted to okay, clarify want to clarify that. Yeah. Um, Michael, you have any comments? You, you say comments in general? Sure. Okay. Uh, or questions? Yeah, I have a, a couple additional examples that uh, I collected here. I'll pass around to the board members of uh, projects that involved adding a, a second story on t to an additional original structure. Uh, my general feeling is that uh, this can be done successfully, although this particular project looks like it's a little excessive in height on the second story. The, the massing seems to be uh, make it more dominant then uh, I would like to see, these are examples of less dominant second floor additions that I think uh, were more successful in integrating a second floor into an existing first floor and still preserving the uh, historic character. Okay, um, Roger. Did, um, so in your discussion with Martin, no, with uh, Arnold, you met with him several times, I guess. The, what I've been hearing from staff quite a bit is that the daylight plane you've shown would not be acceptable on most of the homes we've done. That the actual, the daylight plane can actually go right up close to the wall, but the staff I've been working with has discouraged us from doing daylight planes quite that close. Are you looking on page uh, A4.1? A4.1 up in the upper right hand corner. Yeah. You have the daylight plane hitting hitting the overhang. Correct. Which right. I know is okay. Correct. But in Arnold's world, no. <laughs> uh, we didn't we didn't hear any objection to that from Arnold. Well, it may have been because of the how I'm just saying um, you know, I see Arnold almost every week. So um, this has a, become a big deal with staff as far as now. I can understand it's an historic home and everything like that. So maybe you're, you're getting a little bit eased on that. So yeah. um, I have to admit, I, I, I mean, I like the look of the house. It looks really good and everything. I, as I, along with the previous comment, I have to wonder whether or not it's, it's, it does change the overall look of the size of the house, especially on the new south. You can, it's almost, a two-story wall, with, except for a little, a little bit of roof across at the uh, in the middle. Um, so I, but I mean, I like the way it looks and everything. I'm just curious about the, what was the house and now what it's going to be, if it's, um, if it's somehow I would, I don't know how you do it actually, but the up and it says New South which is, I guess, facing the street, correct, or not? Correct, yeah, it's, that's facing. So Colton. there's one little strip of roof line there. Otherwise, that's a full two-story wall. And um, again, individual review comments, would that would not be acceptable. So, um, but it's an historic home and it should get some exceptions. So, um, I'm, I, don't, I don't know, I don't think, I think it's a well done house, I've just, when I look at the requirements that I'm receiving, this would not be acceptable, this large two-story wall facing a street. So I'm not sure what to say about that. Other than that, I mean, it's nice looking everything. I'm trying to understand, I think, a combination here. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's the actual width of the uh, the width of the second story, but the way I'm seeing it here, other than raising the first floor to nine feet, which um, the second floor is eight feet, and the roof, the roof pitch is very is sloped pretty low, so I don't know how you could really get much tighter than eight feet. Um, I actually think I'm surprised that eight foot six isn't isn't acceptable height because I'm a tall guy and I'm eight foot six ceilings are very roomy to me, but I mean eight foot, you know, is. <laughs> It's kind of at the limit, but I don't know if there's any any thoughts on it. Is it just the width, well, or? But again, I don't see a real way to. 
other than not extending the first floor up six inches, I don't see another way you could avoid make it. You could make it any shorter. Well, the the eight foot ceiling is the wall height, but the ceiling and sides, in, I assume, in his room as well. All the bedrooms slope up on, yep. the, on the second on the floor. floor. On the yep. second floor. On the second floor. Yeah. Right. So you, even though it's an eight foot wall, you get come in the rooms feel quite large. Depending on this is a low pitch, so you don't gain a lot, but the room would not be just eight feet. Yeah, I'm just wondering how you how you'd be able to make that shorter. Make what shorter? Make the actual the ceiling height shorter. You're saying actually it, you you. you it sorry. starts out at eight it, feet, and then the right? inside it slopes up or it pops up, or I guess all the. I imagine Martin's done that as well, but all the bedrooms have a higher ceiling than eight feet. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about the first floor, aren't you? Well, I was talking about the first floor before as far as the, the, the need about raising it up six inches. But even in the second floor, unless you start encroaching at the outside wall to go below eight feet with a low slope roof like that, I don't know how you can really. The only way you can make it slower is to actually encroach in the, in the footprint to bring those corner, the, bring the edges down below eight feet, right? Yeah, you can, you can drop, but that's not Sorry. really an issue yeah. in this project because as long as he's under the daylight yep. plane, it doesn't have to. But you could drop the, on the second floor, you could drop the, the, the plate height two inches, so it would be seven ten, and because it's a vaulted ceiling, you wouldn't notice that at all. I think, my, I think my only point was it is within the daylight plan, and my only point was it, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem unreasonably tall given the constraints is what I was I think I was trying to comment on. But well, I think that one of the issues as is I'm looking here is when you look at the side, which the south side, and you look how far back the second floor is from the at least from the porch, that's that's pretty good. And then in the house, it's it's another five or six feet back from the front wall. So you are kind of the emphasis is on the existing roof line in the front, which is acceptable. Uh, it's again in my world with Arnold is that that second floor I'd have to go back. Uh, typically, the second floors have to go back nine, ten, eleven feet instead of the four or five we have here. But this is an older home and all that, and you're trying to work. So, yeah. I would. I don't really have any issues. So I'd, I'd like to sort of move the discussion on, um, since what Arnold has has reviewed here is in front of us. Um, I have the same concern about raising the first floor to nine feet that mm -hmm. I think Brendan does. I have a house that has an eight foot four ceiling, and uh, I have a very large, you know. Two living room, dining room is essentially one space um, of about 40 feet long, and that's very comfortable. Um, my concern about raising that six inches is it seems to me that you then effectively have to take everything apart. So um, uh, that not only I would imagine I know will significantly increase cost, but I'm not sure where you know, how that really cost right. the benefit, where the benefit is. So I'm assuming you could, well, describe to me how, what you're going to do with all the, you know, the character defining features, like the knee braces, for instance. Yeah, yeah. They're all going to be removed. The, uh, I've done this on another project um, in Palo Alto, or is, is in a historic district. And um, uh, it's all, yeah, we just salvage and then re re reattach. Yeah, so n n none of that fabric's going to be thrown away. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. assume that, but I just wanted yeah. to hear yeah. it. By the so, rec for the record, that will happen. Okay, yes. so could we focus for a moment on your picture that you provided of the knee braces? Yes. Um, as I'm looking at these, uh, we're looking at a corner where, and I, I, I guess this must be in the back of the building? Uh, no, this is uh, facing Fulton Avenue. Um, so uh, Fulton. Th looking at this picture? Yeah, this, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, 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 Fulton Street is to the right of that photo. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a rear. It's the rear of the house on the left-hand side of this photo, and and the rest of the house is on the Fulton Street side. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as I'm looking at these two prominent knee braces, yeah. they're different. Mm -hmm. And one of them is newer. I can't quite figure out which one. I think it's the one on the right. Well, it's, these are all existing. Well, okay, so there there is a variation there. Um, I'm just looking at the way the bevels are cut, and that might oh. just be a um, okay, function of the 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 um, 
Oh, could be, yeah. The photographic view. Could be. So how would you differentiate the new knee braces from these? Yeah, uh, so we discussed that with um, uh, historic planner Vance. Uh, instead of having a little, um, the little uh, uh, chamfer or the taper. The 45 degree cut yeah, at the end? Yeah, we, we just do uh, just square. Okay. Yeah, and then same with the little, the bottom brackets here. Instead of having that little chamfer, yeah, we just block them off straight. Yeah, so that'd be our differentiation. Okay, um, I'm not sure that I think that's a very attractive differentiation, but um, I, 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 would, I, I would encourage you to work on a different plan that, that doesn't reproduce this, but that still is differentiated. I think that okay. that angle, those, those angle cuts yeah. are, are the epitome of what these knee braces look like. So I, I, I agree. This other project that I made reference to where we uh, salvaged the existing brackets and then we, and then I was also adding a second floor to a historic structure. Um, then we, um, we actually uh, replicated the, the ones, um, uh, but, but using, um, uh, so these are four inches by four inches. And, and then for the second floor, we did three and a half by three. Uh, we'll find out, we'll find some way to so, differentiate, yeah. So that by itself, because yeah. material that's available now yeah. is three and a half inches net dimension rather yeah. than the full four. four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that would be adequate differentiation okay. by itself. And Fine, I, I just can't see those being square. Um, I, Totally agree with you. Um, okay. Looking so for I'm, looking for differentiation, right. but uh, well, however we get there, fine. Uh, sure. uh, the other board members can weigh in on that, but that would be my suggestion. Fine. Um, Good. And the and the knee braces on the garage will match the second floor. Yeah, correct. Yeah. All right. Um, go ahead, uh, Michael. Could I, could I just, just a quick question on these brackets. Are these brackets in these pictures the existing ones? Or these are all existing. Yes. Okay. All right, Michael. There you go. I have one additional comment. Uh, if you look on your drawing A4.1, and we look at the uh, the elevation new south. Yes. On the upper left, you have uh, on top of the the roof. It looks like a little shed dormer. dormer. A yeah. Little shed shed roof right there. Correct. Yeah. I think if that was eliminated, it would serve to diminish the appearance of. Uh, excessive mass okay. being added to the structure. If okay. It's just I, purely eliminated. Sure. Okay. You would have less stuff sticking up in the air right there over the existing. Structure. Okay. That that that'll work for us. Okay. Yeah, I actually had that on my list of things. I okay. don't see that motif any place in the building. Does, doesn't okay. add, doesn't add anything to it. It really yeah, detracts it, from the, the yeah. whole. I, I, that's exactly what I felt. I think that okay. it would be much Good. simpler okay. without yeah. that. And that I mean that'll. I mean. The common words I've heard is about the uh, yeah the the perceived mass of it. Yeah. We can we can uh, re remove that item. So if I can continue um, in the um, let's see if I can find this. Um, there is a <clears throat> bedroom number one on the first floor on the new I think the new first floor. If you go to page A three point four. Yes. Which is the second floor floor plan. Yes. It looks to me like you've got a, a fan-shaped roof design there. That's existing. Yeah, but I, when I look on the elevations of 4.1, mm -hmm. I don't see that anywhere. Let me take a look. Um, I mean, there, I, there, there it is right there in the new north. It's a bay window. First floor, uh, new north, first floor, there's a bay right. window there. Right, but, but there, there, there's no... Those well, I, hips aren't well, in there, I, okay. right? Those, so sure. those are two different things, and I'm not picking this apart. But you could you could frame it without it. doing that of raised hip. I'm, I'm, draw hip I'm drawing the uh, the hips. I'm drawing the ridges. Okay. Um, sure. Sorry, just I, I, I'm asking not of as a, I'm not criticizing. I'm <laughs> asking as a clarification. Got it. I'm, I'm adding it right um, now. Okay. There was uh, a. a a, d a comment about a variance for the basement. Correct. And I guess this is a question for staff. Should the board weigh in on that or not? I, I don't see that as being an historic um, resources issue. So the variance is not a zoning code variance. It's a, it's a variance from the flood zone regulations that require a historic, I mean, the, the exception, if you will, is from the flood zone requirements um, 
is hinging upon the preservation of a historic resource. That okay. the findings for that flood zone exception, if you will, okay. are based on a historic resource. So right. retaining the integrity of the historic resource is important. Okay, so that way. what we need to do as a board when we make our final determination is to decide whether or not this, the historic uh, fabric of this building uh, is retained uh, to a great enough extent for that, um, to qualify for this variance from the flood zone. That just, so I'm clear about that. Is that right? Okay. Correct. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see any streetscape um, elevations. Uh, usually we would see adjoining properties. Yeah, uh, we, we have that. I have that. Um, I mean, it was an initial submittal. So. Okay, so I, obviously you'll have that one that comes oh, back yeah, to us. Oh yeah, of course. Um, and let's see. Um, I wanted to uh, reference a comment in our board packet from a neighbor that wants us to uh, to not to allow this project to move forward because of construction impacts in the neighborhood. I'd like to say that I am totally sympathetic with that, but that's totally irrelevant to what our what we consider as a board, and so um, respectfully, we'll not be able to address that. But I did want to make reference to it because it's part of the public record. Michael? Uh, just another comment. Uh, right down the street from this other project you mentioned in here, the Willis Polk House, there's a house at 857 Hamilton that has a, a similar upper story that appears to be at it. It's under renovation right now. And it does look pretty good, the job they've done to it. But I think the second floor add on is definitely subordinate to the, the primary structure, which makes it, uh, in, in my eyes, uh, successful. Okay. That was eight, 857 Hamilton? 857. Okay, we'll take a look. So uh, I think my final comment would be, um, I, I like the design. I think that this works pretty well with the existing building. At, at, um, you know, the reality is uh, larger, larger houses are um, driving all, you know, all real estate development in the city. And this one is sensitive to the original designs. I am um, uncomfortable about raising the first floor because I think that triggers a huge amount of demolition that just doesn't need to be there. That's just my personal feeling. Uh, I would feel more comfortable about the whole project if that were not here. I, I echo that, that so, feeling. Um, in a new house, I don't think it matters, but in an existing house, that's really taken a, that, that's a significant demolition problem. Okay. Other than that, um, I look forward to this coming back. Uh, nice, nice job, um, even if you are a board member. I had one more Michael. question. Uh, the survey indicates that it is, was surveyed and determined to be eligible for the National Register. Was it ever taken one step further and actually nominated for the register? The, uh, it's, uh, Accepted? To, to date, I uh, don't think it has been. Um, but I will read you the, um, uh, it's, it's a good question. And that could be a, a separate conversation if, if the thing goes on. But right now, the ordinance, does, it's not, it's, it's, that's as far as it is right now, it's eligible. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wondered what the yeah. status of the, yeah. the process was. It looks like it was. Yeah. Determined to be eligible by the uh, the, the part the, yeah. the DPR form right here, yeah. 532 form. Okay. So I can answer a couple of those questions. Okay. Uh, so it was deemed eligible for the National Register, and by deeming something eligible for the National Register, it is automatically eligible for the California Register. So this one has been sent to the state and is listed with the state as a historic resource, as a California historic resource. It is not listed uh, individually on the National Register, though that next step has not been taken. Uh, and additionally, to speak to um, Vice Chair Bauer's comment about when this project will come back, uh, that's if this project needs to come back, uh, if these updated plans meet the standards uh, and are in alignment with what we're hearing today, then I don't believe it would be necessary to send it back to the oh, board. Oh, okay. Just so, to just to clarify, right? Because this was 
it's billed as a study session, so I assume that it right. would, that's the preliminary step in a formal application. Um, so well, I'd like to speak to that. So, you know, um, we have a situation here where this is not governed by our, our city ordinance for historic preservation. Um, it's only governed by um, the California Environmental Quality Act and the steps that they're taking to, you know, um, for this flood zone. So, you know, we're, we're trying to approach it with, you know, input from the HRB, you know, and get it to the point where it is complying with the standards so that it can be determined that it qualifies for this variance from the flood zone and um, and we're following through with CEQA, but it is not subject to the city's ordinance for historic preservation. So if we were, so I don't, then, then I, I don't understand how you, how you, the staff can reach the FEMA, the, 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 the bar that allows the basement to remain. If the Historic Resources Board doesn't make a decision about the integrity of the existing, um, you know, design features and historic fabric, who's going to do that? Staff? Well, uh, you know, the, the national guidelines for all of this, the, these exceptions, um, don't, don't have, uh, it doesn't say that it needs to be on the city's local inventory. It, by virtue of it being listed with the state of California as a resource, mm -hmm. that's enough for us to do this work as far as determine compliance with Secretary of Interior standards. Um, yeah. But the, the, this has to go through the individual review program, right? It's currently in that program okay. as a formal application. Is there a formal site plan? Yes. This is all, all I have here is Ed, Ed Wu's drawing. Um, is there a the site, site plan? The site plan should be sheet A 1.0 in your plan set. I have no 1.0. I have three. Oh, I see. It's on the front page. Okay. It's awfully small. Okay. So, in other words, it's not coming back to the board. So, actually, that um, if, if I can interrupt, the answer to that is it's probably not coming back to the board. Is that a fair assessment? The assumption is the owners will, um, you know, allow... Uh, their architect to modify the plans so that it does retain the existing plate height on the first floor, given your comments and given the staff comments about that issue, um, to retain the first floor more intact than what is proposed in the plans. So um, I thought it was coming back, so I was making more general comments about this, but um, if it's not coming back, then I, I have um, at least one other question. Martin, how will you differentiate the second floor exterior finish from the first floor? So the uh, existing uh, first floor is a, um, is a, uh, uh, a subtle textured cement plaster. Again, if you look at the uh, uh, building, the drawing with the uh, brackets, you'll see on the uh, middle right side of the drawing, there's a little bit of a texture of the stucco. Uh, so the second floor, <coughs> uh, if we use um, a, uh, if we went to a uh, smooth plaster, <clears throat> uh, same color, we'll probably do an integral color. Uh, if we go to a smooth plaster, that could also help address some of the perceived mass of it here. So if there's, if there's more texture on the first floor and even less texture on the second floor, that could be a differentiation. Um, okay. um, but keep the color the same, same material, but just a little different texture there. Um, and then uh, taking your comments on the, the brackets, we can look at that so there's some differentiation just not an exact replica so i'm looking at this picture that that we're talking about um there's a it looks like there's a downspout uh that there are yeah, that's is, a downspout. is that what that is in the middle that and the downspout, downspout has texture and what that tells me is that <laughs> is that this this texture was what uh it's there's a product that used to be um applied uh generously on houses because they said you could we'll just spray your house with this and yeah. you get color and you get a new texture <laughs> so that wouldn't be the original texture yeah. uh, as roger was just pointing out there's another picture picture where the um and i think it's the next page yeah 
where the texture is actually much less significant. But I just, in bringing this up, yeah. That's the way that, that the board um, asked the Peninsula Art League, which is just across the street here. I remember that. Yeah. To differentiate their new building from their old. Okay, Same right. material, just, sure. different, just different finish. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, I, and I guess I would reiterate, if it's not, this is not coming back, that I don't see how you can reach a decision that the, that the, that the Historic fabric is being retained if you raise the first floor. Gotcha. It's just that's it's going to take everything away, yeah. or or what? It doesn't take it away. Yeah. It removes it temporarily. Then you have to bring it back, and then you have to patch, and and that's really I mean that's a that's a huge difference than just adding the second floor. Right. Okay, I, that, those are my comments. Anybody else have any comments? Yeah. I, I concur with your comments. Brandon, you're okay? Yeah, I, yeah. So, as do I, we, we covered it. Roger, anything further? Uh, no, I think, um, I mean, I can understand the art of trying to raise the first floor at eight feet. You know, in a bigger home like that, the eight feet feels kind of low, but that's what historic homes feel like. The ceilings are generally lower than they are now. But to, cl to clarify, the original ceiling is eight, eight foot six. six. Yeah. Oh, it's not eight feet. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure how to say finalize. I guess I'll leave it up to you, whatever you guys decide. I mean, I, if it can be done and look appropriate, I, I would accept it, but okay. it, it looks So um, I'm just reminded that at uh, 11 o'clock our parking stickers expire. So um, if there, uh, oh, Councilman Holman. I have a global question. It's more really for staff and it's about the role of the HRB. So I appreciate the staff report, and um, I'm not without some experience in historic preservation. And I guess it's easy, and we all fall into this, getting into the details of a project. And it's easy to do that, and projects are defined by their details. But isn't the role of the HRB with a global big picture is, if this were built the way it's being proposed, or even with the changes that the HRB has recommended, would the building still be eligible for the National Register? And I think that's the big global question that the HRB is not addressing. And maybe that's a question for staff um, about the role of the HRB and so. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very valid um, consideration, but I, I think, I don't to address this. I think the process that we've just been involved in where we're doing a study session for a project that doesn't come back to us is a flawed process. And I've said that with other um, projects like this. Um, I'm happy to weigh in and I think all of the board members are and design issues, but uh, I just feel that the board doesn't have the kind of tools it needs to do the kind of evaluation that Councilman Holman is talking about. We could do it, but at this point it's it, yeah, I mean, uh, it's not, relevant. it is not spelled out in the city's old historic ordinance that your job is to ensure that eligible national resources are, you know, are, keep their eligibility. There's nothing in there. There's no teeth. We do have, I'll just say, um, you know, a couple things that are going on here, um, but I know you have to leave, but um, if we want to finish this one, I can sure, talk to you about that. Things. You know, it's also possible when you had a second floor, you have the existing ceiling, and then when you put the second floor up above that, you can pop up in the middle of those rooms to get a raised ceiling and still have the original eight and a half feet on the outside it's because you end up getting six to eight inch raised, so you're going to be up close to nine feet. And that, that just saves the issue of uh, reducing. Okay, never mind. So, um, Maybe that's a topic for a retreat discussion, <laughs> is, is how we could get the, um, uh, encourage the council to actually give us better tools. I have one. Hold on, hold on. Sure. So uh, thank you, Martin, um, for, for the presentation. And I guess we'll move, we will move forward with updates and uh, uh, board member comments. Yeah, you want, you want to speak?
Um, Amy. Actually, um, the, uh, if the board pleases, I think the uh, Nick French, owner's representative, has a few comments. Certainly. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Great, thank you, and thanks again for your time. I just want to make, on behalf of Hui and Fan, I just want to make it um, clear the intention of the family, right? So as we went through this process and, and engaged with Martin on, on trying to preserve the historical um, significance of you know, Palo Alto in general and this property being included, we obviously want to make sure it also um, is practical for the family, right? I mean, obviously there's a reasonability that we should be looking at, right? These structures are expensive. Construction, of course, is there. Um, part of what we're hearing, I, I understand there's a lot of subjectivity included, and I'm, I'm hearing that amongst you today as well, talking about um, how tall you are and how, you know, the ceiling of 8'6 is, is good enough. But you also, I think we just need to be reasonable to think that, you know, what we think is reasonable may not be the same to other people, right? And so for the family looking at doing this project, um, I've encouraged them from the beginning that we really want to maintain that character of Palo Alto, but also being sympathetic to um, people's goals, right? And one thing that's very important to this family is that nine foot ceiling. Um, not coffered ceiling, not vaulted ceilings, but having a nine foot ceiling. So we've really been trying to work with, with the historical uh, pieces of this, of this process to kind of make that work. Uh, we started with 10 foot and we've sort of kind of kept dropping that down. Um, we've talked about the cost involved and of course, yes, there will be a significant cost to do it, but you know, that six inches is an important piece to the family doing this project. And I just, I want you to understand that because when we're going through and seeing, you know, if we are going to pursue it, um, that could be a make or break situation. So it, it is important. You know, we talked about um, the shadow that's going to kind of cover that extra six inches. So obviously if we go to the 10 foot, that's significant. We get it, which is why we kind of pull that back. So um, I just want to make sure that's under, you know, that, that's clear. That's really there. I think that's pretty much the one big contentious item we're talking about. Yeah, um, I, I would um, add to that that you're not the first, um, this is not the first project that's come to us with that, with that concern and that interest. Our perspective is uh, in uh, applying the Secretary of Interior standards to these projects. I think a pure application would say you can't have a second story because it, there is, a, there is a, a, an argument to be made that the second story totally destroys the character of the building, and that's what you're trying to preserve. So I think that when we make comments about specific items, it's with the understanding, of course, that, that the, the, the owner of the property wants to have the best house they possibly can to fit their needs. And I don't think we're ever, I know I don't make comments ever about those needs. My comments are always, uh, or at least I try to make them about how we apply the Secretary of Interior standards, which are our tools, to a project. You know, I grew up in Palo Alto. Um, I can remember when the first house that I built as a builder had, a, had any ceiling higher than eight feet because that was the standard. Even though my house is built in 1923, is eight six, like this one. That was the standard then. It went to eight feet. Now we have standards nine, 10, 12, those aren't standards, really. Those are just changes in design and appeal, and they're no—they're not um, any less um, legitimate. But they—they they don't really apply to what we—what we're doing here. That's so. Just so you understand, we're not trying to make it difficult for your clients. Of course, yeah. We're just trying to apply uh, the tools we have to this project. No, no, I appreciate that. But just respectfully, I heard earlier when you were talking about the raising of six inches. You talked about one of the negative things being the additional cost, but quite frankly, the additional cost is really not your concern, right? I, I, I don't think we were talking about the additional cost no, financially. I, 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 we were referring to the additional cost to the to, to the change of the existing structure, pulling things off, the uh, you know, and and you know, would that cause damage to you know the the, the, the it was not, not not at all financial. It's okay. the historic integrity we were referring to. Okay. That, that was a peripheral yes. I, yes. comment of mine. My part is that you know these projects are costly enough, right? But uh, to have to add that cost and at the same time lose the, the fabric, as we describe it, that's really the issue um, I was trying to point out. Yeah, and I so. appreciate that. And so, and just to give you an idea and as well, so like really the goal here is to maintain Palo Alto, because obviously we, we're all seeing it change, right? So that's, that's sort of the elephant in the room. So this is just one more house that we definitely want to try to keep, because it is nice to drive down Hamilton and see some of these older properties. 
but so I'm doing everything I can to really help promote that to keep, to keep these kind of structures. Uh, with the six inches, obviously there is that, that the impact, which, which Martin mentioned would kind of come back. And from street side, right, you know, six inches, you're really not going to notice it from the street side, but if you're inside the house, six inches is a big deal. So again, I just want to encourage you to really you know, appreciate the fact that that, you know, for this particular project, which as you mentioned, has come up before, but that is, uh, that is a big consideration for the family. So. Sure. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, um, Amy, updates? Yes, I want to get you to your cars, um, but just quickly, I wanted to let you know that uh, last night the Planning and Transportation Commission was due to take on um, this, uh, uh, I call it the loophole. Uh, we, we've proposed, and uh, uh, Councilmember Holman, I believe, mentioned this at the last a a HRB meeting, and so we quickly, Okay, well, anyways, we, we pop popped it into the ordinance that is under review um, by the Planning Commission and to, to get to the council. And this is basically to say that, you know, remove the, in the incentive t or um, close the loophole, basically. So if someone comes in with a one-story home, says I'm going to demolish this one-story home because I'm proposing a one or I'm going to demolish this historic home because I'm only doing a one-story home and it's just a building permit, not subject to CEQA, you know, and demolish it and then they come back with a two-story home in the IR program, well, this would say, you know, you have a five-year cooling off period where that's not, so, so it, it may have an effect of um, closing that loophole um, and discouraging that behavior. We don't know. It's a possibility that that might have an effect. So that, uh, that went last night to the Planning Commission. I wasn't there, so I don't know how that conversation went. Um, then the other things that are, um, we'll talk about at the retreat, I believe, is uh, the comprehensive plan update that the council approved on November 13th. There are some historic preservation policies. I don't want to go over them completely today. Um, you know, tomorrow is the end of the, of the challenge period, so, um, w but there's some good news in there talking about, you know, um, the eligible properties with respect to our inventory. I touched on that a bit. And then um, there's quite a few uh, um, historic, historic uh, related and archaeological related comp plans policies that um, we'll just go over at the at the retreat. So this wasn't part of our um, our packet today. I wonder if you could no. email it to us. Sure, certainly. Um, I did email this to um, the chair with respect to the project that you just reviewed, um, sure. so he's aware of the the, the new policies and the comp plan. Um, mm. But yeah, we'll send that out. All right. One real, one real quick question. When you get all these um, drawings and data and all this, do you keep any of that up there or do you put it on, I guess you'll have it on the computer, is that right? Are you speaking of the website that the no, city has? No, just in general. I mean, I, I open some of my desk drawers and they're filled with old drawings and stuff from previous okay. meetings we've had. And I, I, I guess now with the computer, you just, everything goes on the computer, I guess. Is that we, ha we do have, um, well, there's the web pages. I think things uh, will live on there for, for some time. Um, but yeah. then we also have our um, uh, kind of a cloud storage where we, where we have to retain projects that have come through the city, um, at least those that have a planning application. And then building applications, same thing. They, they have a way of storing things. So, so maybe next meeting or something, I'll just bring some of my little collections to see what I'm ta tell you what I'm talking about. <laughs> Okay, I have one update on. I'm sorry, one more thing is um, whether we do uh, election of chair and vice chair at the retreat. Um, that's a, something we could do then or on the 25th if we want to put it off until the 25th. Um, we, we need to, we should do that every year. I, I would so. uh, think that we do it on a regular meeting. Okay. 25th. Is it? Okay. Um, I wanted to do an update on the Mills Act subcommittee. We met again uh, last week and I think we've made. Um, very good progress. We should have a, a draft to circulate um, soon. And uh, we, uh, subcommittee members, look forward to sharing that with the rest of the board. And uh, of course, staff sees it, so. And we do have one thing to report out on, which was the city council approved the revised contract with the Squire House mm -hmm. um, so that we keep the one Mills Act contract that we do have uh, for the next uh, 10 years. That was a, a success, otherwise, um, there was a non-renewal that was pending. Um, so, yeah. One of the issues that we could not resolve at our meeting was what happens if we actually put in this program, which is, has requirements and specific performance um, metrics in it. What do we do with the, the one Mills Act that we have that's 
totally non-compliant. So I guess we, we will have to address that at some point. All right, um, Karen. I'm, I, oh. I think this was at the last council meeting and I'm trying to sit here trying to remember exactly what it was, but there were two things. I don't think this was a planning commission meeting. I was, I'm having a foggy memory about this, but there were a couple of things that the HRB had brought up that actually came uh, with the code cleanup or something that was recently adopted, and I'm trying to remember what in the world it was. Um, there were a couple of things. Marty, in particular, had been promoting them. I'll have to go back and look. Yeah. Well, maybe you. Um, I'll have to go back and I'll have to go back and look them up. No. There's too much going on. Back to Emily. You need to fill that out. Okay. A any other comments? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Oh. Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. See you next time. Happy, happy holidays, yes. everyone.